Welcome to the Human Reboot with me, Emma Last. We have uplifting, inspiring and diverse reboot stories from people sharing the courageous, honest, authentic and sometimes difficult life lessons. The Human Reboot will provide proven mentally flourishing formulas and practical tips to help you to live life to the full, giving you direction and hope. Make your mental fitness and well-being a daily priority. Learn to pause so that you can get clear and perform at your best. Switch off to switch on. It's time for your human reboot. Before we start this episode, it may contain conversations that may be triggering for some listeners. If you feel that might apply to you, you can check the show notes for more details. So today I have with me the very amazing Chikare Ibokwe, um, who is an experienced recruiter and diversity and inclusion leader. And she is the founder of inclusive.co.uk and also um, the Allyship Book Club, um, which I am very proud to be a member of. Um, Chikare has really helped me um, over the last um, 12 months with my um, allyship journey. Um, And so, you know, I'd love her to be able to share a bit of what she does um, with you today. So would you like to introduce yourself, Chikare? Yeah, definitely. Um, First and foremost, Emma, thank you so much for having me. Um, And thank you for using your platform to amplify my voice. I am a true believer of allies and the power of allies. Um, And as Emma was saying, in terms of my background, I come from a recruitment background. I fell into recruitment after university and just loved it. I have worked the London market for a number of years. I recruited very, very senior HR professionals into financial services, technology, fintech organizations. And I have always been very, very, very passionate about diversity and inclusion and the role that recruitment plays. And I think for me, unfortunately, going into organizations whereby I was always the only one, I worked in organizations where I was always the only person of color. I would go and see clients and I was always the only one. And I always tried to make sure that my talent pool was diverse and inclusive. So regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, um, religion, disability, for me, it was all about getting the right candidates to the client. And I also believe in making sure that organizations are representative of the um, communities they serve. So for me, that was really, really important. But as I said to Emma before, I think last year really was a year of awakening. It's a year whereby everybody stood up and I guess they could see the discrimination faced by minority people. So obviously in the midst of that terrible, well, we're still in the midst of the terrible pandemic, really. You know, we saw, you know, people, you know, people suffering, people dying, And then we had the George Floyd murder. And for me, you know, it really was time for me to take action and use my platform to create change. So first and foremost, I set up Allyship, um, which is a community for allies. And off the back of that, allies were, you know, definitely reaching out for um, education because part of being an ally is self-education. So I set up the Allyship Book Club and I'm really proud that Emma is is part of that and, you you know, she learned an awful lot from being part of the Allyship Book Club. And then I had organisations reaching out, you know, um, and that's where Inclusive came in. So I, you know, I guess for me, I'm on a mission to ensure that organisations, you know, are aware and they're um, equipped to deal with diversity, equity and inclusion. And people, allies in particular, you know, are equipped as well to have difficult conversations. So inclusive.co.uk and allyship.co.uk are my babies at the moment. I'm very, very passionate about them. And I'm really, really passionate for active allies like Emma, like Emma, who use their platform to amplify minority voices, such as my voice. So thank you again, Emma, for having me. Oh, I, well, you know, I'm hugely passionate about myself. And I think, the more that I've learned, the more I've wanted to learn. And also, I mean, for me, 
it was early on last year, really, when I was working on a project, um, it was actually to write some content for a mental health and wellbeing book to support teachers in supporting children. And this, this started prior to the pandemic. And what was really interesting about that is we really wanted to kind of help teachers to understand about you know health inequalities and those Mm. groups that may be you know more at risk to mental illness and when I started looking into that the barriers that people face in life the more barriers people face the more chance they have of developing a mental illness it's and yeah the more I started looking into and asking you questions and actually do you know what you've been amazing because I've been able to ask some questions that that I perhaps wouldn't have kind of dared to ask and having a safe environment to do that has been it's just Mm -hmm. been invaluable to me really but today we are on the human reboot podcast so please would you share with us um all about your human reboot so tell tell us about a time where you feel that you've overcome adversity and you know gone on to thrive yeah, definitely. Well, let's rewind back to 2020, um, really. I think I really did overcome adverse adversity then. I think for me, January 2020, I just started a brand new job. I was motivated. I couldn't wait to start. It was really, really exciting. I had lots and lots of plans. And then March 2020, I was sent home on furlough in the midst of this crazy pandemic. And I remember panicking. I remember talking to my husband about it and he was like, Chikare, calm down. Things will be fine. I remember watching the news, binge watching the news, taking all this information in. And I think, Emma, I've mentioned this to you before. I remember, you know, not sleeping, waking up in a panic because I had watched too much news. I was worried about the pandemic. I was worried about my job. I was worried about everything. I was worried about my children And then roll on, I think, when was George Floyd murdered? He was murdered, I think, May, April or May. And then I was distraught, Emma. I felt like I couldn't control. And at the time, what was really, really helping me was exercise. So I'd wake up each morning and I'd go for a run. And I really had to do that. And what I decided to do was during the evening, not not binge listen to the news. So, you know, the last, I'll probably listen to the news at 7 p.m. And that would be it. And it was just devastating, really. And I think for me, you know, actually setting up first and foremost allyship community, that really did help me, Emma, because what it actually did, it helped me have conversations with allies like yourself who wanted to learn, you know, who wanted to, I guess, share their experiences. It, you know, that for me really, really helped me. And I really poured my heart and soul into it. You know, I really, really did. And I guess that's what really gave me the strength, really. It really did give me the strength to pick myself up and dust myself off and carry on because I have never, ever been a problem who has suffered from, you know, mental illness, really. Um, But I think last year, and I think we've had this conversation, Emma, many a times, last year I felt, you know, I felt broken. I really, really did. Um, And I felt broken for many reasons. I felt broken because of um, the pandemic. I felt broken because of the injustices that really did come to light. And I remember thinking back as a black woman finishing university, starting my career, and all those times, you know, that I probably ignored that I probably was really discriminated against. And that's why I was broken. And I didn't want that to happen to my sons. And it was a case of let's take action. And it's so funny. I was joking with a friend over the weekend and it was a case of who starts a business during a pandemic? I do. And do you know, so, do you know something, Emma? That was the best thing I did. Starting inclusive and allyship during a pandemic was the best thing I did because I haven't looked back. And I think what is really exciting for me is speaking to organisations, speaking to people who really want to make change, who really want um, to use their platform to create change. Because I think pre the pandemic, um, you know, when we spoke about diversity and inclusion, rightly so, it was all about gender, rightly so, it was all about sexual orientation. But race was something that people never felt they could I guess, talk about. So what the pandemic has done, and I guess the sacrifice that George Floyd made, 
well, he was he was murdered. I guess he didn't make the sacrifice. But anyway, um, was the fact that we are now talking about race and, you know, there are people in organisation who really want to make a difference. So for me, I would look back at 2020 and say, you know, change happened for me. And it was positive change that happened. But before that positive change happened, I had to go through a lot of heart, heartache, a lot of adversity to come out the other side. And, you know, my work is not done. You know, I'm still having conversations, but, you know, hopefully I'm using my voice. I'm using my platform. and I'm speaking to influential people whereby change is happening. You know, it may not happen in my lifetime, in our lifetime, but change is definitely happening. Oh, I'm really hoping it will. I think, you know, I think there's a lot of people that are really starting to kind of open up and start to listen. Um, I'm hoping that 2020 has you know helped people to kind of take a different perspective on life not to be perhaps as judgmental as maybe they were previously and perhaps to be more curious about you know what people are saying because I think it is important to listen to what minority groups are saying yeah you know and and actually you know really kind of see you know what what can be done to support them in in not feeling like Mm -hmm. that because it's important for us all to feel like we belong Um, and when we don't feel like we belong that is also you know a huge 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 barrier to life and it's it's a huge barrier towards well it's huge it's huge causes of stress isn't it Mm. Mm -hmm. which we know leads on to mental illness which is definitely we want to give people the opportunity to have you know an equal platform in life and Mm. and actually I think the big learn for me is it's not just about having an equal platform it's about being able to hold the ladder down is what somebody said to me which I thought was a beautiful phrase which is if you're in a position of influence is to hold the ladder down to you know to minority groups to be able to kind of you know hold the ladder down put your hand down and help them climb up that ladder so that they can just have an opportunity, the same opportunity that perhaps we we might have had or we might have had yeah. a bit, bit more privilege or or, or, yeah. Yeah. or or whatever. But it's it's not just about viewing it as, yeah, we're all equal and we should all we be equal. It's it's also viewing it and thinking, well, actually, what are the sort of systemic things that have have gone on that perhaps might not have meant that that person might have had the same opportunity as me? Mm. And if I am in a position, I'll hold that ladder down and help them get up. And do you know what? They might take that opportunity, but they might not. But that's about, you know, giving the opportunity and, and opening that up to to more people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And do you know the funny thing about it, Emma? You know, it's all about education. Because I think the problem with race is it's such a difficult topic to talk about. You know, think of the injustices. The injustices has gone on for over 500 years. You know, we look at slavery and everything else. And I think the problem is, is that what people have been taught and is now being dismantled because a lot of that information was wrong. So it's a case of people are starting from the beginning. So things that people thought they knew, you know, was true, it's not true. So it's almost like people are now on a journey of education and discovering, rediscovery, because even what our children are being taught in school, if you look at history, look at what happened last week, I think it was, the Commonwealth War Graves Memorial. In the First World War, they didn't acknowledge any of the African or Asian soldiers, you know, so that has come out recently. So there's lots of things that a lot of people thought were true, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, they've had to, it's almost like they've realized that it was all completely wrong or they were never taught. So it's all about learning. And if we look at stereotypes, for example, I, you know, I always say to people that stereotypes are so dangerous and we have to be careful, you know, so everyone's learning. So I think the first and foremost, everyone's got to learn. And that's one thing I do. I do the allyship workshop, which really, um, is one of the best, best work workshops that I actually do. But it's all about learning. It's all about learning about what an ally is. It's all about learning what microaggressions and what privilege mean. What does white privilege mean? You know, and how do you use your white privilege to do good? So I think the, the issue is let's start learning. And what I say to people a lot is, you know, as an ally, it's your job. It's your, it's up to you to actually 
learn you self-educate yourself and Emma you know before we went live you were talking about a book I had mentioned to you in the book that you were reading you know so you're taking that initiative to educate yourself you know and that's what people unfortunately have to have to start doing now and as you can see it's um it's not an easy thing to do because all of a sudden you know one thing and you know you're now being told that what you did know is incorrect so it's a case of how do you help you know, minority, your your minority employees and staff who, you know, can suffer such great, you know, so greatly from, from mental health issues, you know, so what can be done to help them? You know, how can you make your organization more inclusive? You know, so there's so much work to do, but hopefully the more conversations we have like this, the more people will become aware and hopefully the more people will you know, we'll make change. And that's, that's all, that's all we can ask for really, Emma, you know. We've had so many conversations, haven't we, about the kind of interwovenness of mental well-being and, and that feeling, that lack of feeling of lack of belonging and race and an inequality. So it isn't just, you know, we've got to bear in mind those knock-on effects, haven't we, as well? So it's not just about the opportunities, it's about the overall well-being of, of people as well. Yep. So just to find out a little bit more about you, mm-hmm. in this podcast, we always ask, how do you switch off to switch on? So, you know, it's important to learn to pause so that we can perform at our best in our work or, or home life. So um, tell me about how you switch off to switch on. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So how do I switch off? Um, And as I said to you, number one, I stopped binge listening to the news. Okay. Because that really was affecting my mental health. Um, I try and watch lots of lighthearted things. You know, there are lots of crazy things on Netflix that I love to watch. Just lighthearted thing. I think for me, it really, really does help. Um, Before I hurt my knee, I used to exercise an awful lot because that really did help me. Really, really did. Um, you know, just walking, you know, or running or cycling, love it, absolutely love it. So I try and switch off that way. Um, you know, I'm a mother to two teenage boys, so you know, um, just looking after them, you know, they're my 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 my, my everything. So it's just so nice that we can sit down as a family and have you know a lovely conversation about whatever. You know, that really, really is nice. Um, sometimes I even pop upstairs. My, so my younger son is Josh, Joshua, and we have a little go on Mario Kart or whatever, even though he cringes every time we do things like that. So really, Emma, for me, it's all about, you know, trying to switch off from that day-to-day life. And especially over the last year, it's just been really, really difficult. So it's not even the case whereby I've been able to book a holiday or been able to go out. You know, I've been at home. So just trying to do things that will take my mind off, you know, the, the, the everyday bad news that has been churning. So it's even simple things such as, you know, reading the book, you know, watching a movie with my husband, you know, so just really, really, really simple things. Um, Cause I found it really, really helpful. And really Emma, knowing when to switch off, you know what it's like when you run your own business, I write all yeah. my own, you know, courses. So it's knowing when to switch off. And I think I've spoken to you about this before, knowing not to have, you know, maybe two or three um, very intense workshops in one day. Because I know at the end of it, I'm going to be completely, completely shattered and mentally, um, you know, tired from it. So just very, very simple things. Listen to, you know, listen to my body, you know, listen to music. Music is another thing I, I love to listen to, but more so happy things. Try, I try and do more happy things. But Emma, it's not easy because the past year hasn't been easy. The past year is not normal. Yeah. So the normal things that, you know, I would probably do, you know, I haven't been able to do it. Like maybe in a normal situation, I would go and see my mum and dad or I'd go and see my nephews or my siblings. And I haven't been able to do that. So really just trying to be able to switch off, sit in the garden, you know, and just just take my mind off of what is going on today. That really, really has helped. But it hasn't been easy because it's so, you know, it's not easy to switch off sometimes. Yeah. And I think also when you're so passionate about something and you're doing something that's so mission led, it does have, you know, it is important to know kind of when you need to take a break, because, you know, if you don't look after yourself, then you can't look after those around you or those that you want to serve. Of course. And that's the problem. It's all about listening to those signs, 
you know, listening to the signs so that I can sort of like look after myself and knowing when to switch off. And that's what happened last year. I wasn't switching off. So this year I really have made a conscious decision to switch off. And it's not always easy because I'm really passionate about what I do, you know, and the more people I can talk to, the more people I reach, you know, hopefully the more a difference will be, you know, will be made. So um, yeah, you're, you're so right. It's no, it's no when to switch off. Yeah. I remember the week of, well, I spoke at one of your events, didn't I, on International Women's Day. And that whole week was just an emotional roller coaster for many and so, so draining, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. Because what did we have that week? So um, we had the Harry and Meghan um, interview. So it was right after the event I did for International Women's Day. So I did a whole day. Then we had the book club. Then we had the whole Harry and Meghan. And also it was the Sarah Everard murder, which again was distressing, you know, and it was awful. And it's so funny you said that. I felt, and I I don't know if I've spoken to you about this, last week for me was that week again. So what did we have last week? We had um, the George Floyd murder verdict, which really I just felt, even after Derek Chauvin was found guilty, I was distraught because I know lots of people were shouting that, oh, justice has been served. For me, that's not justice. That's accountability. He was found accountable of his actions. So for me, that was really, really stressful. And what else happened last week? Last week was also um, the 28 years since Stephen Stephen Lawrence's death. That was really, really stressful. And then we had the report, the Commonwealth War I think War Grey's report that came out to say that African soldiers and Asian soldiers weren't recognised. So for me, last week was that stressful week, that week whereby I felt broken. I honestly did. And I know I spoke to you about that. Yeah. You know, last week was that week for me. I think it's just been so conscious that, you know, people talk about people being empaths and things like that and Mm -hmm. almost like absorbing that into your, you know, sort of into your skin um, in and it, and it, I suppose it's that now you've got, and now it's really kind of at the forefront of the work you do as well. It's just, it's probably even more, it probably hits home even more. Um, it does. You. It does. It's just, it is, it's a really difficult, it's a really difficult thing. You know, even, um, you know, I did a, a post last week about the George Floyd verdict and it was like, you know, is this a line in the sand? Well, hopefully it's a line in the sand for black and minority people to say, do you know what? You know, let's hope there will be no more injustices. And, but it's still not right that he was murdered, is it? You know, it's just, it doesn't go, it just makes you think, you know, I remember being, I think me and Stephen Lawrence Mm. were, are very similar ages. Would he Mm. be about 46? Yes. Um, Yep. Yeah. So I remember, so I'm I'm slightly younger than him, but not much. (laughs) So um, I remember that time when I was younger and I just, I couldn't believe it. I think that was my first exposure to racism. Um, I just, I couldn't believe people would be so horrible. Uh, You know, as a child, that was what was in my head. Mm. But, you know, the funny thing about it, Emma, is that, you know, what happened to Stephen Lawrence, there's so many more, I know this is awful, there were so many other, there's so many more people before him that have faced really awful, awful deaths. You know, he is just one of many. And the same with George Floyd, he's just one of many, unfortunately. And I think what's really, if you think of it, how old was he? He was 18 when he died. So my son is going to be 18 next month, you know? Um, My son's going to be 18, looking forward to university. And Emma, why should anybody, anybody be discriminated against because of the colour of their skin? Why should my brown skin be a problem? But unfortunately it is. Why should my son's brown skin be a problem? You know, why should they be discriminated against and stereotyped, you know, because they have brown skin? But it happens every single day. And it has got to stop. And we have, we've got to call people out, you know, um, because my sons will still go into a shop and be followed around um, by a security guard. And I've seen it happen. It happens. OK. And it's the case. Why should they? You know, why can't they just live their life like everybody else? Why are they judged because of the color of their skin? And that's why I said she's stereotypes are so dangerous, you know. And, I, and Emma, you know, for me, um, you know, 
this is my lived experience as a black woman in the United Kingdom with a black husband and black sons. This is my lived experience. And this is why I have got to use my platform to create change. And this is why I'm so passionate about it that there are days and weeks whereby I do feel broken because it really gets to me. And that's why, you know, when we talk about mental health, it really is important because it is so, so difficult. And there's so many people that suffer, you know, and there's a lot of performative action out there, Emma. There are lots of organizations who say we're going to do this, we're going to do that because it's for them. Everyone else is saying it. And it's a fact, it's fashion, you know, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to say because all their clients and their competitors are doing it. But for me, this is lived experience. This is real. I'm not just just doing this because it's fashion. I'm doing this as a DEI consultant because this is my lived experience. And this is a lived experience of my two black teenage sons. And I wrote a blog post about a couple of months ago. And the title was, when will my sons go from cute to threat? And I put a picture of them when they were little, because when they're little, oh, so lovely, so cute, so gorgeous. And as soon as they grow up, it's like, whoa, everybody's scared. All the microaggressions come in, you know? So I think we really have to think about it. And we need to realize that this is from, for many people, for millions of people around the world, billions even, This is our lived experiences and these injustices have got to stop. Oh, it makes me so sad, but really hopeful as well at the same time that with people like you and allies like me that and the allies that I've met, that we can make change. So just uh, our last question for you. So are there any personal tips that you can give that help you to live life to the full so your personal flourishing formula for life that you could share with our listeners yeah definitely I think the key thing is just I think for me I see people every see every single person as an individual and I think the key thing is don't think that because a person's black or white or Asian you know I don't try and fall into those stereotypes let's just take every single person as they are Educate yourself. It really is important. Read, 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 read. Okay. Um, read happy books and read sad books. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it is the way it is. Um, look after yourself. Try and exercise. I really find exercising really, really does hurt, even though it's quite difficult for me to do it at the moment because I've injured my knee. But um, exercise is really, really, really important. You know, eat properly. Food is something else that we know that, you know, we have to try and eat properly and for those of you who are in positions of influence definitely try and use your 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 platform to to create change really and if you're not sure about you know what you can do or where you can start you know start by educating yourself start by speaking to allies such as emma you know um reach out to myself as well we would definitely put you in the right direction but i think you know i think especially when it comes to looking after ourselves i think the key thing is we really have to try and do things that wouldn't put too much pressure on us in you know mentally you know go for walks cook they're the kind of things I would say and just you know truly immerse ourselves in the different worlds you know because you know our world at the moment is quite a troubling troubling world you know you put on the 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 television and it's just absolutely awful you know in terms of all the injustices all the suffering that's happening so I think we really have to take our way ourselves away from that and really look after ourselves. Because as Emma said, you know, once you look up, you know, put Emma, I think you told me this, you put your oxygen mask on first and then you can actually look after other people. So, you know, definitely you know, look after yourself first and foremost before you, you know, put that oxygen ma- mask on somebody else. Oh, thank you so much. Are there any books or obviously you've talked about your allyship uh, book community, but are there any books or anything that, that you think that would help our listeners to kind of make a start on an allyship journey? Rene Edo Lodge has got a great book called um, Why I'm No Longer Speaking to White People About Race. That is fantastic. Ibram X. Kendi, he has also got an amazing book out called How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, they're just little books you can start with at the moment um but i said to you definitely go on to www.allyship.co.uk and there's a list of books that you can get um and definitely join us in the book club we love to have you you know we need more more allies so um yeah please definitely join us well thank you so much i have absolutely loved this conversation chicory 
and oh I would love to have you back at some point in the future when I'm talking to other people who may have experienced barriers like you have. Brilliant no I just want to say again thanks for having me thanks for being such a great ally and I think you've always been an active ally and I think for me that is really really important you've always self-educated yourself and I would love to come back you know let's just keep having this conversation and thank you for using your platform to amplify my voice it's been amazing thank you oh thank you thank you for listening to the human reboot podcast I'm Emma Last And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star podcast review and visit thehumanrebootmovement.com where you can find downloadable free resources, sign up to my mailing list or connect with me on social. So that's thehumanrebootmovement.com. Let's switch off so we can switch on. It's time for your human reboot.